the internet, this is Jacob Clifford. In the mid-1950s, a creative entrepreneur started a business that changed the world. No, it wasn't Walt Disney, it was Malcolm McLean. Who? You've probably never heard of him, but his invention influences almost everything around you. So what did this guy McLean do? Well, it has to do with shipping. Early on, goods were loaded onto ships in sacks, barrels, and wooden crates with scores of dock workers, squeezing them on decks or in tight spaces below. Ships often spent more time at ports than sailing, and not much changed until 1956. That's when American truck driver Malcolm McLean stacked 58 metal boxes on a ship going from New Jersey to Houston. His idea was simple. Instead of unloading individual products, you unload the entire container, and that makes things way more efficient. That's a pretty good idea. And his process, now called containerization, lowered transportation costs and created global markets. Since it's now easier and cheaper to ship things, there's no reason to produce something if another country can produce it cheaper. Container shipping moves 95% of all manufactured goods around the world. You learned about the benefits of trade back in Unit you know, 1 when we did comparative advantage, but now we're going to show these concepts using supply and demand. So here's the graph, and for this example, let's use portable Bluetooth speakers. This shows the domestic demand and supply and the equilibrium price at $30. This is the price if we produce these speakers in our own country. But what if we can get speakers at a lower price from other countries? Let's say $10 is the world price. Before I jump into it and show you what happens, try to figure it out for yourself. Where's consumer surplus, producer surplus, and deadweight loss if we trade at that world price of tech. Now, if you think consumer surplus is here and producer surplus is here and deadweight loss is here, you made a mistake. A lot of students see the price here at 10. They go, well, there must be a shortage. We're only going to produce 10 units, so we're going to have some deadweight loss. But there's not going to be a shortage and there's not going to be deadweight loss. If the price is at 10, the producer surplus will be right here, and that's $25. Remember, the equation is 1 half base times height. The base is 10. The height is 5. 5 times 10 is 50. Cut in half, 25 is the producer surplus. So the producer surplus got smaller, and it's actually the same if this was a price ceiling. But when there's a ceiling, we're only producing 10 units, and there's a shortage. But in this case, we're filling the shortage with imports. At the price of $10, domestic producers can produce 10 units. But people want 90 units, so we're going to import those 80 units. So again, the amount we're going to produce in our own country is here. The amount consumers are actually going to get is here. So that means consumer surplus is going to be a whole lot bigger. It's going to be this whole area right here. The actual calculation, it's the base, which is 90, times the height, which is 55 minus 10, so 45 times 90. Cut in half gives you 2,025. But the big idea here is to understand that consumer surplus got bigger. This shows the benefits of trade. And it also shows you who doesn't like trade, domestic producers, because producer surplus got smaller. Total surplus, the consumer and the producer surplus, was this before trade, and now it's this after trade. All the people that are willing to pay $25 or $20 or $15 before trade didn't get the speakers. But now, with trade, they can get the speakers. International trade is good, and it mostly benefits consumers. But what happens on the graph when the government gets involved, when there's quotas and tariffs? Assume we're buying things at a world price at $10, and we're importing 80 units. The government comes in and says, listen, we're going to put a quota. You can't bring in more than 40 units into the country. So we can't import 80 units anymore. So instead, we only do 40 units. The result is a price that's right here at $20. In that case, consumer surplus would get a little bit smaller, and domestic producer surplus would get a little bit bigger. And the same thing happens when there's a tariff. If the international price was back here at $10, and the government says, listen, we're going to put a $10 tariff on every single unit you import. That's going to change the price to 20 Again, like a quota, consumer surplus gets smaller and producer surplus gets bigger. But do you see the box of tariff revenue generated by the government? It's this box right here. That's the tariff revenue generated by the government by putting on the tariff. Remember, it was a $10 tariff and we're importing 40 units. 10 times 40, $400. So to put it all together, after the tariff, we have consumer surplus, producer surplus, tariff revenue, and these two triangles, deadweight loss. It's loss, consumer, or producer surplus that doesn't exist because of this policy. So there it is. Back in Unit 1, you learned about comparative advantage and why countries should specialize in trade. And here in Unit 2, you're showing that concept on a graph 
showing that consumers benefit from international trade. And now that's happening more than ever because of Malcolm McLean. So what object am I gonna put on the wall behind me to help you remember the idea of international trade, consumer produced surplus, and Malcolm McLean? Well, it's this a shipping container. Many of the things around you right now were once in a shipping container and you got them at a lower price than if you had to produce them yourself. Not only did you have more consumer surplus, but you had money to go buy other things to make your life better off. Dang, it's a sledgehammer. Lucky. But don't go anywhere, we still have two things to do. The first one, if you like this video, if I'm helping you learn and love economics, it's time to subscribe, like this video, and leave a comment. Also, be sure to watch my unit summary video where I talk about all the concepts in this unit over again to get them back in your brain for your test or your final exam or the AP exam. And the second thing we gotta do, it's time for a pop quiz. <laughs> At the end of these videos, I give you a few multiple choice questions to verify you're actually getting it. So try those questions and look in the comments below for the answer key. Thanks for watching. Until next time.